even if you find who shot him, he's not going to bring him back. And I want him back. That's the part I want. I don't care about who shot him. I just want him back. I don't want him dead. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Five. to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. We want to bring you an update now on another big case we've been following for you here at Court TV. It is the romance novelist murder trial. Defendant Nancy Brophy, 71 years old, on trial right now, accused of murdering her husband, Daniel Brophy. Still on the state's witness list when things start back up on Monday, Nathan Stillwater, the son of of the victim and the stepson of the defendant, who sued her in civil court too, by the way, for the wrongful death of his father. Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae has re been reporting for us on this case from Portland. She has the very latest. Women who shared Nancy Brophy's passion for writing were among the prosecution witnesses on Thursday. Jessica Smith and Terry Reed are the first friends of Nancy Brophy, who this jury has heard from, though they've heard from several people who were connected to through work or were relatives of Chef Dan Brophy. Uh, what the prosecution wanted to draw out from these witnesses and focused on is whether Nancy ever shared with these close friends her late 2017 and early 2018 decision to purchase a gun like the Glock she bought at a gun show four months before the murder. On cross, defense attorney Lisa Maxfield made it clear they wanted to bring these witnesses back during their case, signaling to this jury there's more to the story. Did there come a time that Ms. Brophy talked to you about the purchase of an unassembled gun kit? Yes. Uh, do you remember when that was? It was between March and May of 2018. And did this conversation occur uh, while Ms. Brophy was talking to you about a story that she was writing? Uh, objection, Your Honor. I'm going to sustain that. Did Ms. Brophy talk to you about her purpose for buying the gun kit? Uh, objection. Without stating? I, I, I overruled. Okay. I think that's a fair question. Yes. What the defense wanted to draw out there that the seemingly sudden decision to purchase a firearm and a ghost gun kit may have been part of Nancy Brophy's creative process for a thriller book that she had in the works. Court is dark here on Friday when things ramp back up on Monday. It's expected to be the state's last week of presenting evidence for their case in chief in front of this jury. Reporting in Portland, Oregon, Julia Janae with Court TV. Let's discuss this case now together, shall we? Let me bring in criminal defense attorney Josh Schiffer. Okay, Josh, so uh, here we've got Nancy Brophy on trial accused of murdering her husband. Her attorney promised she's going to be testifying. And then with every little nugget of damaging evidence that comes in, like some of that we saw there, you know, you have to wonder how in the world she could explain all this. Your thoughts, please. It's a question of how she's going to explain this or what she's going to explain. But remember, there's still a big lacking hole in this case from the state. And her decision whether to testify is the penultimate event. Yeah. Because if the jury is considering that the state, yes, did show a motive, which is the big thing that's missing, mm -hmm. the, for, for her to participate in such a dastardly plot with all these other extraneous things, that's a big, that's a big deal. And that could absolutely put it in the uh, state's favor mm -hmm. if she doesn't testify very well in her defense. At the same time, if she comes off strong, and is believable and authentic and remorseful about the loss of her husband, this jury's going to be out for a very short period of time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's got a shot. She's cloaked in the presumption of innocence, as we know, doesn't have to testify. It's her right to testify or not to. Um, tell me, Josh, do you think in ways Nancy Brophy might have been her own worst enemy based on some of the evidence we've seen, like, for instance, some of the calls to detectives, you know, the asking for the letter, exonerating her three it, days it, after? It comes to that, how, do, how are people supposed to react? And, you know, whenever we've seen great loss or trauma, our brains kind of go, oh, this is the right reaction that we're seeing, or this is the wrong reaction that we're seeing. And we have these predetermined, uh, you know, kind of concepts of this is what it's supposed to look like when you're playing the role that she was in. And some of that behavior doesn't look like that role. And some people are going to look at her actions and behavior 
in the time after the death and question why would she act in that way and does that make them more suspicious or less suspicious and with all the circumstantial in the evidence in this case that's a big question huge risks getting on the stand uh, but also the rewards if she wants to home run this a good uh, good example of testimony and being truthful and authentic wins this case hands down yeah, you know, I think another thing to think about that I'm sure you think about quite often in your practice uh, doing criminal defense work almost exclusively in Atlanta is that when you're on the defense side, all you really need is a one to get on your side, huh, Josh? It's not carrying the burden. We don't have the burden. People always say, hey, Josh, how do you defend these people that do stuff? And I'll admit, lots of my clients have made, politely, poor decisions. Poor choices, exactly and, and right. I tell them, the Constitution's amazing. The Constitution requires you to defend them. The better the mm -hmm. state does that I can make the state work, I, that's how we keep our system honest. We deserve the best prosecutors out in the world and their jobs to carry that burden like a football, jump it over the line. If I can stop them, mm -hmm. that's my constitutional duty. Yeah. I'm making your constitutional protections better by testing the state and making them do their job. Right, right, Josh. Um, well, thank goodness we have people like yourself who will do that job. It's a tough job to do. And really, I mean, for anybody who asks that question, how can you defend someone? Pick up the Constitution of the United States of America and read it, and you will see why you must defend those people. My job's in the founding document. Absolutely it is. <laughs> founding fathers said so, Josh Schiffer. They said you got to do it.